Wow, what an introduction. Praise Yahuwah. Welcome to our explosive new series, Restoring Creation. What? You mean the church does not teach the account of the Bible? Well, unfortunately, in many cases, most no, they don't. And we'll prove that out, and you'll see that as we go. It's time to restore this narrative. Watch, test, and learn. More so, they don't really even know the narrative, generally, as it's basically gotten little to no emphasis uh, you know, from seminaries even, because, well, it's the Old Testament. So they're the New Testament church, so they don't like to read the Old Testament. Well, then they have no foundation, because the proper foundation uh, in Scripture is critical, and creation and the flood are the proper foundation. We should all understand these things. That's why we spent so much time on this, and we'll continue to in this series. It's too important. Those teaching the New Testament without even knowing the so-called Old Testament, which is a ridiculous name for it, uh, there's just the writings of the apostles and prophets. Uh, I mean, it's it's not old, uh, but it's taught by Messiah. Therefore, it's freshened in the New Testament. The apostles taught from it as well. Peter's first salvation message is from Joel in, in the words of David. Hello. Uh, that's the salvation message. And to not get that in the so-called New Testament church is ridiculous. That includes the Ten Commandments that Messiah taught all ten. Paul taught all ten. We've proven that in our Sabbath series, and even to Revelation, which also includes most of the commandments there as well in the very last days. So this series will restore the Bible position to set a solid foundation, not on sinking sand any longer, which is where much of the church's lies with this. You'll see. We'll prove that. We all need this, and most pastors, unfortunately, are never taught. They're never taught how to research as well. And they do not understand the Old Testament in really the slightest. Uh, We wish we didn't have to say this and that our churches followed the Bible in this, but we're finding most do not. And again, uh, we'll demonstrate this many times, you'll see, uh, as we cover uh, this array of topics on creation. Before we commence with this incredible creation account, detailing and even charting the first two weeks fully of the world, There are a few things that we must establish, and that's the purpose of this video and the next, especially. First, in this video, did Moses write Genesis? Now, I know some some of you are thinking, well, who would ask such a question, right? I mean, to many of us, that's uh, even to ask the question seems just unthinkable. However, uh, first century rabbis, who are, what, Pharisees, <laughs> and they became rabbinic Judaism, so the Levin Messiah rebuke uh, did not go away, by the way. It's still here. It keeps ever expanding and festering and molding, and man, is it rotten today, no doubt. But see, their view tries to attack Scripture, and scholars do the same. They call it textual criticism. In other words, I'm a scoffer. That's what that title says. Uh, Some claim Moses only wrote about um, from chapter 12 on in Genesis. Others say he only wrote small portions of it. Some even say he didn't write any of it. That's what they say. But do any of them prove any of that? No. It's nonsense. And you're going to see that from this video and the next one. And again, we have to clear this out of the way before we even start the account. So we're going to do that. Uh, We've seen it all at this point. Um, Basically, they then take that same mentality, which is steeped in ignorance, and they attack other Bible books all the same. Oh, well, David didn't write all the Psalms, and, uh, well, you know, he didn't even exist, of course. Yeah, right. Um, These are the most illiterate, and they call themselves scholars, but they are not Bible scholars. Occultists is what they are, and they're attacking the Bible. We don't care whether they have PhD behind their name or not, because really all that means is, well, they are occultists because they've uh, graduated through the secular education in most cases to a point where, well, they truly know the occult better than they know the Bible. So 
There is no PhD that ever proves Moses did not write Genesis. Oh, we're going to show you. Uh, and what they really prove is, well, they don't know what they are even talking about. This will be embarrassing uh, to many of them if they ever even watch this channel. Uh, and some do. And some, by the way, are not just watching, but they're following. And there are PhDs who have been behind most of our videos, if not all of them. Uh, some are behind all of them and agree with them. These are not Bible scholars, though, not these ones that we're talking about. They are the very scoffers 2 Peter 3 warned us about, specifically attacking creation and the flood and the deity of Messiah, which is the foundation of the whole of Scripture and much of the church even. They don't even believe the Bible. Then others, mostly occultists, uh, but actually far too many scholars as well, repeat their narratives. Uh, because they can't think for themselves, they can't read for themselves, and they only stay in the scholarly paradigm, and they can't seem to leave it to ever think and reason, what does the Bible really say? Well, it doesn't say what their position holds in many cases. We've already proven this on many topics. They'll claim, for instance, the Sumerian tablets are found in more ancient archaeology because it was written in stone rather than copied over as scrolls are for, uh, you know, ever so often, every century or so or whatever. Uh, you know, they forget the paradigm. They just forget it. And then they, they apply that, well, you know, that's in stone and it can be dated. And, well, I can't date that someone copied over a scroll, so I, I have to say that's older. Well, just because they have to be stupid and live in a paradigm of stupid doesn't mean that we do. The real problem here is we have an entire paradigm of Bible scholarship, which is truly impotent on this topic, and it just doesn't have a biblical foundation. As you'll see, we'll prove it. You'll see it in this video and the next especially. They even listen to those occultists, Nephilim lovers, really, and they repeat them. They infuse their doctrines into the Bible as if they were ever there. They're not, even still. They are ridiculous lies that they're repeating. Now, if you have heard a pastor repeating the same, he's not the origin. And that's not who we're talking to when we call them names like, uh, you know, titles like illiterate or ignorant because, well, they prove to be uh, like Forrest Gump once said, very wisely, Mama always said, stupid is as stupid does. Well, that's what he said, uh, and that's what his mama said, really. And his mama was very wise, because that, my friends, is truth. <laughs> now, warning, this channel is for the mature believer. Some don't seem to get that, and so let's make that very clear. Uh, those that are really seeking the truth, who can handle this? Uh, who, can, who can handle us rebuking Pharisees when we catch them changing the word? Oh, can you imagine anything worse than that? You better believe rebuke will follow that every time on this channel. And we'll use strong language that, by the way, is Bible language. These are Bible words from the prophets to pastors, to Pharisees, and to scholars. From Messiah to the same and with the same tone because you really if you read the bible it's there uh love without rebuke is not love it is incomplete and it's absent one of the most valuable and important tools for you do not love those that you do not rebuke so we are going to rebuke in this series as we catch them along the way but especially in this video and the next warning if we do not well we would not be showing love, nor would we be carrying out our calling. We research in a deep sense for reason, because we are bringing things back and restoring Scripture to its original intent, which can be done in these days of increasing knowledge. Whether scholars like it or not, we don't care what they agree with. Now, we would not be following Yahushua's example, as he did not toy around with Pharisees, but he used strong language. He did not care about their egos either. When he called them, well, the synagogue of Satan, of their father the devil, fools, liars, hypocrites, brood of vipers. Uh, I mean, I, they changed the word into the opposite against his commandments in Mark 7. I mean, how many times did he have to say it? He warned us about their leaven over and over and over. I mean, how many times 
did he have to demonstrate this example of how to treat and deal with these liars? And yet we often hear, oh, don't use those words. Oh, we will, because the Bible does. And that's how you're supposed to handle it at our level. We don't care what anybody thinks of that. Now, well, the prophets did. It's in the Bible many times. One even said, can't you come up with alternatives? Are you kidding? I mean, anybody who has watched our videos knows we use many alternatives. I mean, ignorant, illiterate, uneducated, liars, deceivers, dunderhead. We, we use tons of them, but it doesn't matter whether we ever do. Even if we use the one word stupid every time and we use it a thousand times, it is deserving in rebuke for these scholars who prove to be so. Someone needs to defend the word, folks. And that's our role. That's our calling. Whether anybody likes that or not, it's going to offend, just as James said it would. The truth of the word offends indeed. But the word's been assailed for thousands of years. And we're supposed to, as believers, just be impotent and accept that. We don't accept it. Yahuwah doesn't accept it. Yahusha doesn't accept it. Absolutely 100%. And Yahusha did not in his own words many times. So we care not whom it offends. Uh, we'll deal with this topic then before creation needs to be restored. What happened before the first day? Is Genesis 1-1 even before the first day? Hmm. It's a greatly misunderstood, absolutely embellished topic with Pharisee leaven with things that are not in Scripture and in great amounts, including what was before creation? Does the Bible even talk about it, for that matter? Hmm. Uh, was the darkness before creation evil? Oh, we got a whole video we're going to do on that because it's important to address it now. In fact, Pharisees tell a completely different story from the Bible, uh, though some facts are woven in, of course, as they always do, but it's a lie. And again, stupid scholars repeat this trash. That's their problem, not ours. But we'll sift through it, and we'll explain this, and we will restore it. After that, we'll commence with the first two weeks of creation. Uh, without all the hype that comes with it in all of these comments, to say, oh, but, blah, 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 but, 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 well, we're going to deal with the buts now. Okay? And then we'll start the narrative. So there you go. So basically... The first two weeks of creation uh, is where we're heading, and it is phenomenal, the amount of data that we have to go by when we restore the Word. Uh, and this is also important, as this will set a foundation you can rely on for the rest of your life. Test it for yourself. Prove these things, and prove what the scholars are saying as well. We assure you their words will fail and these will not, because we will use credible sources that we've tested and proven so, unlike the many occult roots of modern scholars, which they seem to be steeped in far too often. Put on your walking boots, cowpoke. We're going to step through a lot of horse manure on the way to the truth on this one, but the truth will be restored once and for all. Let's roll them out. Let's go to Moses writing down Torah, defined so even in this passage. And we're going to show you a chart at the end of this video, two charts, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, showing you many such examples where Scripture doesn't play around with this. It says Moses wrote, Moses wrote, Moses wrote, and hey, Moses wrote, and Moses said, and Moses, and Moses, and Moses, and Moses, and Moses. Hello. I mean, this is so well documented. It is amazing this even becomes a question. But here, Deuteronomy 31, 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of the writing, of writing the words of this law in a book. What? what wait, you mean Moses wrote what is called the book of the law or Torah? Yes. I mean, we know some tried to remove Genesis from the book of the law is if it's somehow separated it's not but we're going to show you that don't you worry uh we will obliterate that later and prove those are again not scholars of anything they can't even read until they were finished 
that Moses commanded the Levites. Okay, who are they? The priests, right? The sons of Levi, who would become the tabernacle priests, right? The sons of Aaron, especially. And then the priests in the temple, which would be specifically the leadership, was the sons of Zadok. It was from the family of Zadok. And that's what Solomon placed in charge of the temple worship. And that remained to the first century. Understand that. You want to find scripture, you want to find Bible canon, follow them, nobody else, because they are the keepers of Bible canon. Oh, how do we know that? Well, Moses commanded them to, you'll see. Now, Moses commanded the Levites here, which Levites, specifically the leadership of the Levites, to do what? Well, these are the ones which bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah. They're holy, holy enough that they can carry the presence of Yahuwah, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, well, that's pretty serious, and this is specific Levites. This is the leadership of the priesthood, which again, in Solomon's day, would become the sons of Zadok, who remained in charge of keeping Scripture, Bible canon, to the first century. And Pharisees and their Bible canon, well, they're impertinent as well as the Catholic councils, who had no right to change the Old Testament. I mean, are you kidding? How can they go backwards? That's ridiculous. Who taught they had the authority to overrule Moses? Here is only the sons of Zadok in the first century. Up until that point, kept Bible canon. And even before their family specifically, the Levite priesthood leadership specifically kept Bible canon canon. It's the only Bible canon that we could ever call. Now, we found that, that library, that scroll library, which is a Bible, a Bible canon, uh, in Qumran, Bethabara, which is what Joshua calls it, and that's what ancient maps from the oldest of Israel to 1901 call that area Bethabara, the biblical name. That's the Greek, or Betharaba in Hebrew. Watch our original canon series where we prove that. Now, saying, take this book of the law. Okay, so we're talking about Torah and all of Torah, including Genesis. But again, does it say that? Well, no, it doesn't here in this particular passage, but it does. Don't worry. Scripture never, ever leaves that gap for any scholar or nonsensical, you know, dunderhead to come in and try to find a gap and exploit it. There isn't one. So, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah, your Elohim. So not only did they carry the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of the Covenant had Yahuwah's very presence, physical presence in there, with this scripture. Which, by the way, if there's an error in there, if Moses made a mistake when he was writing it down, um, and it's in Yahuwah's presence... Uh, it would be burned up and gone. It would be destroyed. It couldn't live as a falsehood in his presence. It was perfect. And that proves it. So there you go. Now, again, scholars don't know that because they don't think things through. That it may be there for a witness against thee, because Israel would break the covenant, the law. Now, he'll explain what it, this all means. Uh, but get this. How do we know what books were and were not in the so-called Old Testament to the first century. Well, here is the established authority. You can't miss it. Uh, if you're a scholar and you missed it, well, then you're just a dunderhead who can't read. That's all. Not from the Catholic Church who changed it. They obviously have no clue about this scripture. They can't read. Not from the Pharisees, who also already changed it before that. That's what the temple priests tell you. Uh, the sons of Zadok, the actual ones ordained to keep Scripture. <laughs> uh, and we've shown you that and who defiled the temple. Uh, watch that video. Ezekiel tells us three times the sons of Zadok remained holy when Israel strayed. See, that's important to note, important to understand that priesthood was preserved and so was the scripture it kept. There was not a scribe among them that changed scripture and manipulated scripture. That is a stupid paradigm of scholars who can't read and don't even understand the word or how it works works. So, they try to claim they are Essenes, which we have well dealt with in 
uh, the original canon series. That's a complete lie. The Essene Kabbalah cult lived 25 miles south of Qumran and not in Qumran, uh, in Ein Gedi, where the archaeology, mass archaeology, is there with their name on it. I mean, are you kidding? Who could be so illiterate? Well, the scholars who run the Dead Sea Scrolls are, and they remain so. We have proven that. Watch that series. So they were never known as temple priests, not Essenes. They were never sons of Zadox. They were never known as Essenes. The exile temple priests, which uh, the Qumran community documents identifying themselves as the exile temple priests, the sons of Zadok, the sons of Aaron, the sons of Levi, Levites. I mean, I, how many times did they have to say that? Well, they said it over a hundred. And still, those stupid scholars who read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they don't get it. Oh, duh, I think maybe they were Essenes. Well, you're, you're illiterate. That's all. You can't read. Just admit that to the folks. And we'll dismiss what you have to say because we know you can't read. It's unthinkable. Almost all modern scholars have brought this blatant fraud and can't read. And yes, we will show outreach. And you should too. Watch the original canon series where we prove that. The modern church has lost the enemy because the enemy is within steering them, and especially on this narrative. That's why we have to deal with this to start. From seeing them just as they did 2,000 years ago. But they can't see them. They're right under their nose. They can't see them. Some of them are those people, uh, or at least the ancestors of, or in thinking at least. Uh, but that was 2,000 years ago, already happening according to Jude, Paul, Peter, and others. This is well documented in the New Testament. We are being taught the Bible by the very paradigm of these enemies, these infiltrators of the Bible, who are the opposite. Yahushua called them. I mean, he nailed them. In Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, we've used this many times, that they are the synagogue of Satan who say they are Yahudim and are not but do lie. There you go. They're imposters and liars. Verse 27, For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Yahuwah loved to refer to the Israelites as being stiff-necked, and man, are scholars stiff-necked. I mean, you couldn't think of a better title for many scholars. Uh, that's why it sounds so familiar, of course, but that's an ancient um, <laughs> term. Um, man has not changed much, and uh, we, we only become more evil generation by generation, really, and that's prophesied to be so. Most scholars, academic leaders, are really the worst of the stiff neck. They stick to a paradigm and they refuse to think. They refuse to entertain increasing knowledge. Yet, Daniel said, in the last days, knowledge would increase, which renders them impertinent. The blind leading the blind, as Yahusha said. And this will be evident as we all open our eyes and see. No more blindness, not here we're done with it, and I know many of you are too. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day. Okay, so Moses is about to die. Moses knew he was about to die. You, you get that? That's what he just said. There you go, and it's not the only time he says it. Ye have been rebellious against Yahuwah, and how much more after my death? Wait, you mean Moses knew what would happen after he was about to die? And he knew that he was about to die? And he knew what Israel was going to do? Huh. Can you read, scholars, the ones that try to say that Moses didn't write Genesis because, well, you know, Moses, the, the end of Deuteronomy, writes about his death. Therefore, Moses couldn't have written that. That's a stupid question from an illiterate scholar who can't even read the word. Yet they ask it, and they don't bother to then research even a little in scripture to find right here Moses answered their question already and their question is really dumb when Moses already answered it and they don't know it how exactly can anyone calling themselves a scholar not know this fact how can they claim because the final words of portions of Torah speak about the death of Moses that Moses could not have written that portion when he proves he was a prophet and knew exactly what would happen at his death, after his death, most certainly he could have written it down. Duh. 
I mean, it's like saying, well, people can't write their own obituary. It just can't be done. It can't happen. Oh, wait a minute. That's actually a trend today. People are writing their own obituaries all the time. They love to do it today. Even Steve Jobs talked about it. They talk about it in some business seminars as a very healthy practice, even uh, as an exercise in some of the seminars. But regardless, could not Moses, was he not smart enough? to write his own obituary, which he already saw his death and what was happening after his death. Duh! Of course he did. Now we'll get into this a little further later. Now, gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. Moses is rebuking the Israelites, folks. He sees what's coming. He knows he's a prophet. So Moses is calling heaven and earth as a witness of what will happen after he dies in prophecy recorded in his own words here, because yes, Moses wrote this yet again, and of course, he just said these are his words. Hello. I mean, scholars need to then produce who exactly in the age of Moses heard Moses say these words and wrote this down. Come on. Who did it? Give us somebody. Because you have nobody, you have no answer to this question, and you haven't researched it through, yet you level this allegation at Scripture in confusion. And that is the worst of behavior coming from our so-called scholars. We're dealing with a paradigm that does not even believe the Bible, and they attack it. So let us not look to them as Bible scholars. They are not, unfortunately. Verse 29. Here goes Moses again speaking prophetically of what will happen after his death, but there's no way he could have written about things after his death, right? Because he was dead, scholars say. Duh. Uh, they can't read. Uh, what they're saying, again, is they don't actually believe Bible prophecy. See, that's really what's behind it, and they don't believe the Bible. Uh, for a Bible scholar to admit that is incredibly telling, and I mean, you, you know where they're coming from. They're not coming from a platform and foundation of the Bible. They're not Bible scholars. For I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of Yahuwah to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Wow. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. In other words, there were what? Over a million witnesses. Hello. Nobody challenges this in that day that Moses said this and that Moses wrote it down. Got that? Moses had witnesses that he spoke and wrote of happenings after his death. This has never been in question until modern times from stupid scholars who can't read. They will turn out to be 100% accurate, in fact, right here, uh, the words of Moses. 100% his prophecy is accurate because he is a true prophet. And we're supposed to believe he did not know what would happen when he died. Yet, he just told us he did know. <laughs> and he just told us he was about to die. We're supposed to believe Moses could not possibly know where he was going to die, for instance, or uh, the details surrounding it, how long they would mourn, right? Uh, yet the mourning period was already established in Israel. Duh. He already knew how long they would mourn. I mean, come on. This is ridiculous to think that Moses didn't write the end of Deuteronomy. Of course he did. He knew the future after his death, already prophesying in writing of other things. So if you say he didn't write the end of Deuteronomy, then scholar, you'll have to say he didn't write this either, right? He couldn't have known these things. He, he, he couldn't have actually been a, what, a, a prophet? You know, that the Bible says he's a prophet, that Messiah called them such? I mean, uh, hello, N don't think so. This is not a scholarly position. And it is complete nonsense. It's illiterate and it lacks faith. But let's continue. So let's address this head on. Messiah said in John 5.46 to the Pharisees, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he, Moses, wrote of me. 
So Moses wrote, folks. There you go. Now, what, what's he talking about? Did Yahushua say someone pretending to be Moses wrote of me? Uh, oops. No, doesn't say that. That settles it, period. Because those scholars are calling Messiah a liar. How dare they? Who do they think they are? Moses wrote, not some leader-cursed imposter who claims they are Moses. Moses wrote. Yahushua said so. What a ridiculous paradigm for a so-called scholar to hold. So where did Moses write of Messiah? Well, the first prophecy of Messiah appears, and we have never heard a scholar disagree with this even, for that matter. Uh, so odd how they seem to even forget their own paradigm in their own positions when they say dumb things like this. But it's right here in Genesis 3.15, where Yahuwah told Satan, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, Satan's seed, not spiritually, and her seed. Now, well, who is her seed that is to come that's prophesied? That's Yahusha. And that's well attested in scholarship. Most scholars, if not all, believe that. Uh, some don't hold the view, perhaps, but who cares? Uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll address this several ways, though. The first prophecy of Messiah in Genesis was written by Moses, regardless, and you'll see. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Also, this is a reference in Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, there's your second witness where Yahushua said twice, Moses wrote of me. Boom. Done. Where would Messiah begin with Moses writing about him? Again, Genesis 3.15, as well as the book of Jubilees, which we're going to get to that as well. Yahushua addressed Moses again regarding a tradition that is from Genesis, not Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy in origin. So here you go. This is an endorsement that Moses wrote Genesis. John 7.22 Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. Oh, wait a minute. Where did circumcision come from? Well, Moses wrote it, but it comes from Genesis because it was first instituted by Abraham. Oops! Genesis and Messiah say so. And in parentheses, we even have this here, not because it is of Moses, but of the Father. So the KJV even clarifies that for scholars who can't read to be able to understand, and they still don't get it. Abraham, in fact, as the practice uh, started way back then, and this Genesis... There you go. Uh, that's where that's recorded, as well as Jubilees, and written by Moses. And again, we're going to, in the next video, uh, the origin of Genesis, we're going to bring this home in such a way that there will be no debate. It's settled. Done. Super clear. And ye, on the Sabbath day, circumcise a man. And of course, he goes on ripping into the Pharisees, which is how he handled them. He did not turn the other cheek, folks. When he faced the Pharisees and they opposed him, and even many times he caught them before they even said anything because he knew what they were thinking, even. And he just let them have it. And he used a very strong language, which is what you're going to get from this channel whether anyone likes it or not. It requires maturity to listen. We understand, and that's fine. Anyone not mature enough? Well, that just means you're not ready for the meat of the word. And you know what? When you are mature, come back and watch. These videos will be there. Let's hope. And here is another proof, a big one, from 2nd Esdras in the 1611 KJV, uh, KJVA, even and we have tied this book to being used in the Qumran scrolls to interpret prophecy using second estrus very specifically watch part 25 of answers in second estrus where we show that uh, and read that book we published with torah test historicity etc free and ebook at two estrus.org remember the written torah was destroyed in the fire when Jerusalem was sacked as the southern kingdom was taken into Babylon, right? This is the return now, uh, the time of Ezra, and the rebuilding of the temple. That's why he wrote 
Ezra, Nehemiah, 1st Esdras, and 2nd Esdras. Four books. Now, it was the prophet Ezra with five scribes, he says, uh, assisting him, uh, whom Yahuwah used to restore Torah at that point uh, and the rest of Scripture to that point of history, of course, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Here's what he has to say, and man, does this tell it all. But if I have found grace before you, this is Ezra speaking to Yahuwah, send the Holy Spirit into me. Yes, the Holy Spirit is an Old Testament concept as well, not just in the New. Hello, he's in Genesis 1, so that's pretty easy to see. And I shall write all that has been done in the world since the beginning. Wow. Now, that is very specifically Genesis. That's the history to creation, folks. Not just law, yet he's about to call it the book of the law or Torah, which is the same thing. And Genesis, Jubilees are part of it. So he says, which were written in your law. So the law includes history since the beginning, meaning Torah has always included Genesis slash Jubilees, which are the two witnesses of creation to the flood. Now, we're going to vet Jubilees more in part three, uh, and we will definitely bring that home. But we've published that book, so you can download that at bookofjubilees.org. Um, and read the introduction and the Torah test and see for yourself. We've talked about that. So this is what Ezra says, right? Uh, the book of the law or Torah, uh, you know, included those. So who cares what modern scholars say when they disagree with the actual expert whom they clearly are not? And by the way, Ezra was called the expert, even by the king of Persia, uh, in the law, so uh, specifically the law of Moses. So, that men may find your path, and that they which will live in the latter days may live. Well, why would you need the law in the latter days if it's going to be abolished? Because it never was. Oops. Now, that's another topic. Watch our Sabbath series, watch our feast series, and we just lay that out. When he speaks of restoring the law, he includes Genesis and really Jubilees here in this as he references from the beginning of creation. And those two are that history. Uh, and he says that is part of Torah or the book of the law. Period. Done. The end. Ezra wrote this in 400 B.C., Long before any historian that Zondervan knows, uh, they seem to not know about the prophet Ezra. That's pretty bad. And he is a son of Zadok, temple priest, understand that, known again as the expert in the law of Moses, specifically according to 1st Esdras. Uh, that's fact. And used interchangeable, interchangeably in that text is the book of Moses and the law of Moses, I think it's like six times we, we counted that when we just went through it quickly. Uh, so this is not a mystery. It never has been. These were the priests who led the temple in the in uh, temple worship in the temple and kept when they were there, before they were exiled, and they kept Bible canon, even after exile, all the way to the first century, in fact, and we found their library. So this is pretty easy. Never, ever were Pharisees who are useless in such determination ever given such authority. And never are we to follow Pharisees as their doctrines are full of leaven, says Messiah, if you believe him, of course. But it is sad that scholars don't, it seems. So, really, done. There you go. Boom. Case closed just right there, if you think about it, though we're not done. We're going to uh, keep going because there's tons and we we want to especially get into the narratives of the scholars so you can see their words see what they're saying but what are these scholars saying all right let's see clearly they don't know these scriptures that we've covered uh, or they wouldn't ask such questions because they're not questions they're not you know when you are supposed to be educated in the bible 
and you go around just asking one dumb question after another that as a scholar you should know the answer to, but you haven't bothered to do your research. It's called negligence, and it's absolutely a lousy paradigm right now. It is in need of an overhaul indeed. Now understand as well First Esther's reference to the book of the law as the book of Moses, one and the same. Uh, once again, not the book of the guy pretending to be Moses, mind you, uh, who wrote it in fraud and added to it when he wasn't supposed to. Hello. Somehow no writer of the Bible ever believed this nonsense. And for scholars to peddle it is ridiculous. But let's take a look at some of the assault here. In all fairness, they do assume in the end, but it is only assumption, of course, uh, that Moses wrote part of Genesis, which is a lie, uh, which will prove, and we were already on our way there. Uh, but they clearly, they just don't know. And that's, their language makes it clear. They're not committing to a position here. They're saying, I don't know, because they don't. Why even write an article and ask a question or questions you don't even have an answer to? Well, you know, that's called scholarship today. It's really gross negligence because scholars don't accept the responsibility that they, they must take on, which is, okay, fine, you question it. Now you prove it out, you research it, and they don't bother to do that. They just leave the question, and it leads to confusion. It leads the lambs to slaughter. Do we really know what Moses did and didn't write? Now, we're in the middle of the article. Read the whole thing. It's on screen. Uh, this is their conclusion in short. So let's check this out. No, we don't really know what Moses wrote. Really? We don't? Well, only if we can't read. See, this is illiterate as a position, but we're going to prove that. Don't worry. We're not done. While some people believe that Moses wrote everything in the Pentateuch, well, that's also a false Pharisee term. Uh, it refers to the five books of Torah, Penta in Greek. Uh, and uh, sorry, there aren't five. That's not scripture. Scripture never identifies a number of those books. And we're going to prove to you in the next video, there are six. <gasps> what? Oh, blasphemy. Oh, no, no. We prove it. See, we've tested this over years of research. Except a handful of post-Mosaica, uh, the hippopotamus or whatever that is. I mean, they come up with these terms that make them sound smart in there. It's really rather dumb because, I mean, even those that write newspaper articles, they're trained to write at a ninth grade reading level so everybody can read them seamlessly. And that's what, that's what you're supposed to do, but they forget that. And they make up these big words that don't actually mean anything. Post Mosaica, in other words, post or after Moses. In other words, some of Genesis was written after Moses. That's what they're trying to say, and that is ridiculous, we'll prove. And we're going to now, don't worry. The post Mosaica may only be the tip of the iceberg. Well, no, because it's ridiculous and not an iceberg. We'll smash that iceberg now. These post mosaica establish a principle that later inspired editors, redactors. Well, say what? The Bible has redactors? They take a black pen and scratch it out? Is that a Bible practice? Please show me the role of a redactor and editor in the Old Testament, nor the New for that matter. I'm sorry, the Bible doesn't have those. That's ridiculous. If that doesn't cause you to show outrage, then perhaps you need to check your pulse. There was a time when the language changed, for instance, from Paleo-Hebrew uh, or Ancient Hebrew into block letters. So the lettering changed in Hebrew, uh, but scholars in that age, scribes, they still didn't change the Bible. If you find a text that was changed, that's a problem. And probably that is your agitating Pharisees from Samaria at that time or from Egypt uh, who are responsible for the translation into Greek uh, called the Septuagint, which is not scripture. 
right? It is a translation. We can learn some things from it of the thinking in that age, but it is not Bible canon. It was not written by the temple priests. It was not translated by the temple priests because the temple priests weren't in Egypt at that time. They were back in the temple where they should be. Duh. I mean, these things are not that difficult, yet scholars can't keep track of timelines and can't read. Now, we know they did because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which employ the block Hebrew mostly. Uh, and in the Bible, it would be fraud to add to Moses, right? That's what Scripture says. That warning's there several times uh, in any sense. And there is a curse pronounced for anyone doing so. Let's be clear. But let's, let's review that just real quick so you can see those. How can they not know this is the real question. Moses said so in Deuteronomy 4.2 and 12.32 uh, that we're not to add or take away from the words of Torah, these words which he wrote, which includes Genesis and Jubilees will prove. Yet Zondervan, the writer of this, who publishes their own Bible even, is accusing the temple priests, this is how bad this is, of doing so, of being frauds in ancient times and going against Moses' command. That's what they're claiming, and it's, it's, it's a lie. It's never been true. They have no proof of it. They've never produced who it was that supposedly wrote Genesis, if not Moses. They never produced who it was that changed any of these things because they have no such documentation. It's not fact. It's a lie. That is unacceptable. It's lousy doctrine in foundation. John wrote this same curse in Revelation 22, 18, 19. Uh, it's also in Proverbs 30, 5, and 6. And literally, these references, some try to apply John only to Revelation. But John wrote, you know, the four more books. So uh, John's talking about all of his words. And really, he's talking about all of Scripture, including what Paul wrote, including, including what Peter wrote, including the Gospels, and including the Old Testament, really. Now, we all know this. Why doesn't Zondervan? That's the real question. Why don't scholars generally, because this isn't just their position, this is a scholarly position, and it's stupid. It's unacceptable. You don't add words to Moses, or you're a liar and a fraud, according to Scripture, yet they are calling the temple priests who were ordained to keep Scripture, even told in Ezekiel three times they were holy men, even while Israel strayed, but they choose to call them frauds and liars. Well, who are the liars then? Zondervan is, and any scholar peddling that lie. Imagine that as a foundation for scholarly thought. Ridiculous. Clearly, they think it is okay to lie, see? And that's no surprise, because Pharisees are liars. Yahusha called them such. You get that? The Dead Sea Scrolls call them such. So it should be no surprise that we're hearing their lies 2,000 years later. They're caught in their own enigma, as if they undermine the very temple priest ordained to keep Scripture, they undermine the entire Bible. But they don't care, because that is their intent, ultimately. This is a massive accusation, a completely illiterate one. Let's go back, though, to their words and vet this a little further. In Genesis, the narrative speaks of events that take place long before the birth of Moses. Indeed, it does. So, uh, why is that a surprise to so-called Bible scholars? Well, this is the problem. The problem with this is they don't know the Bible. They don't know the word. They don't know the narrative. Now, Moses was not alive before he was born. There's no doubt about that. Uh Duh. That's the only point they actually made here, uh, which is not a point. Uh, it is interesting that Moses is never mentioned in the book, Genesis, of course, even as the person writing down things down. Uh, except why would Moses record himself in a book that, well, wasn't about him, but the patriarchs that precede him all the way back to creation and the flood long before him? Duh. Uh, again, this isn't a point. They can't even think rationally on, on a minor level. This is, this is less than elementary. It's horrible. See, this is a setting of a false paradigm by which to then test, right? But see, it already failed because they don't know how to set a paradigm and they don't know how to test. We find this in scholarship 
all the time. It is always uneducated in the sense it proves nothing except they are incapable of rational thought and they're really good at setting false paradigms and false litmus, litmus tests for someone to then come in and say, oh, see, it failed the test. Oh, yeah, but the, the test is stupid. You, you don't start with a test that's this dumb. That's the point. Unless you just plain don't believe the Bible. Aha, there you go. And how would Moses even know this information? Well, Mount Sinai, of course. Have they not ever read the Bible? They're clueless as to what happened there. But we're going to show you the scripture and the origin in the next video of where Moses got even the very first part of Genesis, which, no, he didn't live prior to when he was born, of course. Duh. But Moses had help here that, of course, Zondervan is clueless and ignores, yet it's history and it's scripture. Whether they know it or not is impertinent. This is not an actual point. It is illiterate, especially when you see Moses did write of this process, that he was the one who wrote it down and that he had assistance with the content. Oh, what am I talking about? We'll get there in the next video. It'll blow you away if you don't know this already. Instead, we encounter a formula. Oh, that's nice. The Bible has formulas? No, that is idiocy. The Bible doesn't have formulas in this sense, uh, especially not what they're talking about here. This is so crazy. Uh, that appears 11 times in the Bible. Book. Oh, it's so scholarly. Uh, in 2, 4, 5, 1, 6, 9, 10, 1, 11, 10, 27, blah, 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 blah. Oh, let's go see those. Let's see what they say. And you'll see for yourself. This is really dumb. This is a manufactured formula that doesn't exist. It's not even true. And again, this stuff is ridiculous. Big headed PhDs patting themselves on the back in their textual criticism, which is scoffing. Ha, huh. hello. Now, a new paradigm of Bible interpretation that never exists in Torah. We don't look at the Bible this way, and we shouldn't. That's the fact. Just plain scoffing, which the Bible says what about? Well, read Proverbs, read Psalm, read what the Bible says about scoffers. Read what Second Peter says about scoffers of this very topic of creation and the flood. He rebukes them as we will continue to. This formula is introduced by the words Ella Toledot uh, and a person's name. In other words, and they say, this is the account of and then name. Uh, no, actually, they just lied to you. That's not an accurate translation, but we'll go there. We'll show you. These sections indicate the use of oral and or written sources, C51, for the writing of the book of Genesis. This is ridiculous. So understand what this scholar is saying here. Because it was written uh, that the following will be a genealogy, well, then that means it must be oral tradition. That is poor, lousy assumption and just plain wrong. It is not. And it must have been written by different people, they'll say which is stupid. So if you were to record the genealogy of your family tree, for instance, every branch of every different name you use to, uh, you know, a different family branch, uh, basically each family branch then means what? Well, it means that it's someone else authored that. Because you're not capable. You could not possibly write of uh, another branch of your family. No, of course not. I mean, do these guys know how to think? No. They're forming false paradigms to ensnare and lead the lambs to slaughter. That's very obvious here. This is not scholarship, uh, nor even uh, logic remotely. Here are a few of these examples uh, that they're using. These are the generations of. Well, that means what? Each of these is a different author. Really? I mean, it is as if these scoffers have never read a lineage before in any sense. It's like they've never read anything. Like they're just children and they, they have no idea, you know, why 
he would continue to say, these are the generations of, and oh, by the way, that's what it says in Hebrew. These are the generations of, we'll show you the word, hang on. Now they make up their own fictional rules to change the Bible, which is what they're doing here. And that's why it would show so much disgust and outrage. And it's fraud, utter fraud. This is a non-point that really is very embarrassing for Zondervan to even write. Then Zondervan also just rendered the Hebrew word toledot, well, improperly, to its scriptural uses as well, changing Torah. There you go. They changed the biblical definition of this word right here on the screen, uh, toledot, uh, to mean an account of and forgotten of what? Of men. It's an account of men. Duh. This is translated and used appropriately in Scripture as generations. And it is never interpreted account of solely. It is account of men. How can they leave the men part off of their definition in utter ignorance? Specifically, genealogies is what this means. 38 times translated, generations, and accurately so. One time as birth, which is the same thing. So how do they get off redefining this word to then somehow mean something else? Well, they're frauds, that's why. These are Pharisees changing Torah in these altered definitions, and they're caught. They cannot get away with it, not here. So just from some scriptures here, very quickly in the beginning, we're already well on our way here to proving Moses, in fact, wrote Genesis indeed. I mean, second Esther's is, wow, no doubt, a firm definition that Torah or the book of the law, one and the same as the book of Moses, and has always included the history of the world to creation. Boom. And when you read First Esther, again, numerous times, the prophets recognize uh, the prophet recognizes that Moses is the writer of the book of the law. Uh, that's never been in question legitimately, not by any prophet, not by any apostle, not by Messiah, uh, who all actually, or well, some actually, even affirm this, which you'll see. Uh, in the next video. Uh, we're going to show you a chart of the many times where it says Moses wrote, Moses wrote, Moses wrote, Moses said, are you kidding me? Once you see these, you'll get the picture. Uh, these aren't scholars. No writer of the Bible ever questioned this. This is new and it's reckless. Uh, we are going to continue this vein of thought into uh, the next video, which will conclude whether Moses wrote Genesis firmly. Uh, and then in part three, the origin of Genesis, which will bring this all home and put a nail in this coffin of useless scholarship. To use a baseball term, a grand slam, the bases will be cleared and no challenge will be left. That's because this has never been a legitimate challenge at all. It's occult nonsense really in origin. It's sad we have to take time to correct stupid scholars who prove themselves illiterate and very confused. But, you know, we don't mind. It's time to restore his word from its foundation, the creation account, and it is the most exciting time to be alive, folks. And we're off to a great start here. Yah bless. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box. And friend us on Facebook at The God Culture space hyphen space original. That is our only Facebook page, only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor and Gab links below. 
We have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that. It's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, softcover, or hardcover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon, not yet, we're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas, uh, rightfully so. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that too is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white soft cover, if you wish. Uh, all books, including Solomon's Treasurer, are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated, and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well. So, no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation. Uh, more coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.